Hello, I'm Joanna Berger. I have a Master's of Science in Applied Animal Behavior and Animal Welfare from the University of Edinburgh. And I live in the United States, so I'm filming this and you'll be able to watch it at your conference in Ecuador. Um, I am outside because the lighting is nice out here and it lets you see a little bit of the environment in Virginia. But I'm going to talk about the behavior of reptiles, especially those native to Ecuador. And you are lucky to have a huge number of different species of reptiles in Ecuador. So I won't have time to talk about specific behaviors of every individual species. I will talk a little bit about the yellow-footed tortoise and anolis lizards and um, green iguanas. but. I'm going to speak more generally about how you can study the natural behavior of a reptile um, in the wild and then use that to make decisions about their management in captivity. And I will be talking about a little bit about ethology and positive reinforcement training and enrichment. So how we can um, what enrichment is and how we can design some enrichment for captive reptiles. So, firstly, I really encourage you to uh, spend time watching the natural behavior of native reptile species. Sit very still and watch very closely and pay great attention to the very fine details of uh, the body movements of these animals. A lot of reptiles communicate social information um, through movements, so you may see them, um, you know, extending a dewlap or um, you may see color changes watch for minute body movements and then ask yourself why you think the reptile is moving that way. Also look at the ecological niche and ask what substrate is this reptile living in in the wild? Is it in water? Is it on a certain type of soil? Does it dig in that soil? Where does it lay its eggs? Uh, what type of vegetation does this reptile eat or does it hunt for prey and where do you know where do um, the prey animals live how does that hunting occur and um, if it you know is the reptile climbing a tree what type of tree and what is the texture of that bark what shape are the branches uh, what position does the animal spend most of his time in is it um, horizontal on a branch basking or uh, clinging vertically to the side of the tree uh, holding onto the tree bark and um, does it swim in the water and if so what type of water is it still water or is it flowing um, you know, what other, what are its mating behaviors? Um, what is the lighting like where you're seeing the animal? Is there a lot of natural sunlight or is this animal spending time in the shade? Um, these are all questions that you can ask uh, to help determine um, what the natural behaviors are and why these behaviors are being performed and how we can simulate the or allow the expression of those behaviors in a captive setting and how we can make the setting in captivity as natural as possible um, so i want to touch on um, abnormal behaviors to look out for the main abnormal behavior that is seen in captive reptiles is called glass rubbing. And this is when um, often a lizard will rub his nose or face against the glass at the front of the tank or hit his nose against the glass repeatedly. And that can cause self-injury, 
it can cause bleeding, um, and it is an abnormal behavior. Often it occurs if the enclosure is too small or too barren, if it's empty and there aren't, um, you know, it isn't an enriched environment. So, um, one goal of enrichment is to reduce abnormal behavior, such as glass rubbing. Other abnormal behaviors for reptiles can be lethargy and depressive behavior. Um, if the animal usually spends time climbing, but suddenly is spending more time on the bottom level of the tank, or, um, you know, is not as interested in food, if the, so um, lethargy, depressive behavior, uh, decreased appetite, um, if they're not interested in their food. Reptiles do eat less frequently than mammals in general, but they still should be um, interested in their food and have their regular appetite. So if you see a decrease in appetite, that can be a sign that the animal may be stressed or unhealthy. Um, most reptiles are prey species, so these prey animals hide their uh, signs of illness or uh, when they are stressed they will often become just less active or spend more time hiding out of sight. Um, you may also see them losing weight, um, so you want to check their body condition if you're seeing their eyes becoming more sunken in or you're seeing more of their hips protruding or more of their ribs. They may not be eating well and may be losing weight um, and may be stressed in some way. You can also sometimes see an increase in aggression and increased aggression could may be an abnormal behavior. Um, some aggression occurs in the wild, especially with adult male green iguanas. They're known for being quite aggressive and being able to injure people, um, especially during certain um, seasons or when they have certain hormones uh, related to mating. But if you're seeing a lot of aggression, it could also be a sign that the reptile is in pain or is stressed by its environment and captivity. Um, but usually we'll see a lot of uh, reptiles hiding or being very uh, lethargic and depressed. To um, promote natural behavior, we can do environmental enrichment in captivity. So environmental enrichment is defined as a concept which describes how the environments of captive animals can be changed for the benefit of the inhabitant. Behavioral opportunities may arise or increase as a result of environmental enrichment and can be appropriately um, described as behavioral enrichment. Another definition is that environmental enrichment is a process of providing um, or enhancing or Im improving the environment for a zoo animal and the care within the con context of the animal's behavioral biology and natural history. It's a dynamic process in which changes to structures and husbandry practices are made with the goal of increasing behavioral choices to animals and drawing out their species appropriate behaviors and abilities, thus enhancing their welfare. And the goals of a good enrichment program are to increase behavioral diversity, reduce the frequency of abnormal behavior such as glass rubbing, um, increase the range or number of normal or natural uh, behavior patterns that we would see in the wild to elicit those in captivity, uh, increase utilization of the environment to uh, make sure that the animal is using all of the space in the enclosure, and to increase the ability of the animal to cope with challenges in a normal way. Um, there are different types of enrichment. Um, a good resource when you're planning and designing enrichment for captive reptiles um, or any uh, type of animal is this book, which is by Robert Young, Environmental Enrichment of Captive Animals.
And also, I highly recommend a organization called The Shape of Enrichment. The Shape of Enrichment has a website and they do have resources in uh, Portuguese and I believe in Spanish. And um, I'm going to go through their enrichment categories, which I think are very useful when you're talking about designing environmental enrichment, um, especially for exotic species. So there are five categories, social, cognitive, physical habitat, sensory, or food. Um, firstly, talking about social enrichment, reptiles are more social than we have previously thought. Some newer research is coming out showing that uh, they do have social abilities. They are not as gregarious as many um, other types of animals like mammals and birds, but they do um, associate with their mates preferentially over other um, members of their species. And they also, um, some species of reptiles spend time in family groups. They do have social communication behavior, um, which can be physical movements, which are seen, so um, their visual system is important. Um, and then they also, some species communicate through uh, scent and scent marking. So scent marking or piling dung to mark the edge of their territories. Um, they are, so, uh, reptiles are capable of social learning. A uh, few different studies have investigated social learning in reptiles and found that it is um, an ability that they have. And they are, some species have been shown to um, recognize and discriminate between um, conspecifics, um, different individuals of the same species, so they can recognize their family members. Um, their, uh, so olfaction and their sense of smell is quite um, strong, and so we can um, do some scent marking um, as an olfactory enrichment in an enclosure. You can put different scents around, and um, we know that reptiles have a strong uh, sense of smell, so putting scents around the enclosure can be a way to get them using more space and investigating um, new, you know, sensing and uh, new, all these new smells. You can also think about housing them in social groups. Uh, that really depends on the species and also on the setup in the enclosure. Um, it has been shown that skinks, so lizards will use, um, will be more likely to sit in groups of three together if they are in an enclosure that has a rocky, uh, like rock-like structure to climb on. And it's also important um, to provide hiding spots where um, reptiles can get out of sight and away from each other and also that helps them regulate their temperatures. Um, so we can think about social en enrichment, although that's not um, usually the main or first choice for reptiles since they are less social um, than you know many species or many types of animals. We can think about cognitive enrichment. I will show you a video at the end of this talk of a, an anolis lizard solving a puzzle. And I'm going to talk a lot about, well, so we can do puzzle feeders as a way to provide mental stimulation for reptiles. You can also provide them with novel scents, as I mentioned earlier, or uh, new types of food or new items. Reptiles tend to be neophobic, so they are afraid of new items. So don't be surprised if you put a new item into their enclosure and 
it takes the animal, a, you know, maybe a week to start using it. Um, but they can also get bored, so rotating uh, new items into the enclosure or moving them around um, is a way to keep them mentally stimulated and improve the welfare of captive reptiles. You um, may want to leave some items in the same place so that the animal has one, at least one familiar item and then just uh, add, you know, maybe add one new item at a time um, and then have an enrichment plan and monitor the animal's use of the items in its enclosure and use of space and um, then maybe monthly add a new item or move one item. Uh, we need to balance the stress experienced um, by you know seeing something new that could be a little bit frightening um, with the positive aspect of having new items in the enclosure that um, are novel and interesting for them to investigate. So physical habitat um, environmental enrichment includes climbing structures. Um, we can give uh, reptiles different types of uh, logs to climb on, different shelves and different multiple levels inside of an enclosure. The enclosure itself um, you know, may not be very big, but you can increase the space that the animal is able to use by adding, um, you know, multiple levels of shelves and different types of branches or rocks. And you can um, also have caves or, you know, items for the reptile to hide beneath little, um, hammocks to sit in. A lot of anoles will sit in, you know, anolis enclosures will have hammocks. Um, you can also do really interesting um, enrichment items like rotating uh, wooden bars that are on one side of an enclosure so that a snake has to, can weave his way in between the bars and they'll rotate so that the snake has to use every muscle to grip and snakes really enjoy climbing and one, one goal of enrichment should be to get these animals using all of their muscles getting a lot of physical exercise which is usually a problem for captive reptiles they often are not getting enough exercise at all um, and even though reptiles tend to be slow moving creatures still um, you know, tortoises do run, they do, um, they, you know, we've got to, and we can't just say, oh, he's not moving at all because he's a reptile. They really, you know, they do move in the wild. They do walk around and climb and slither and gallop. Um, so we want to get all those behaviors happening in captivity because it's good for their physical health and mental well-being. Um, Another really important factor is substrate. Um, think about what type of soil or uh, bedding you should have at the bottom of the enclosure. Um, if this is a tortoise, they may dig and burrow. Um, lizards will dig too. Um, make sure it's safe. The Shape of Enrichment does have a uh, tool that you can use to evaluate um, the safety of an a new enrichment item. Um, so you want to think about any safety issues first um, and then watch out, you know, uh, monitor your animals, make sure that they are not developing any health problems from um, uh, or injuring themselves on the enrichment items that you've provided. Um, one way to help with that is to keep the items simple at first and then gradually increase their complexity but with some lizards they um, some lizards do ingest their substrate especially if you're using sand or crushed nut shells so um, 
uh, make sure that you know they're not ingesting their substrate and risking becoming impacted, having their digestive system blocked by substrate. Um, but there are many options for substrates, including uh, paper pulp or shredded newspaper, which are usually safer than sand, um, or you can use natural soil. Um, you know, th we want to make sure they have opportunities to dig and bury themselves, um, especially, you know, if that's a natural behavior for them. Make sure you have that nest, the den area, um, like a cave-like hiding spot and refuges out of sight. So all animals should have an area that they can go to to be away um, out of public view, which can decrease their stress. Um, you can do that with a barrier um, or with you know, a, a box or a rock with a hole in it. Um, but we wanna set up something so that they can escape the view of people and other animals in the facility. And big uh, area for uh, enriching reptiles is lighting and heat. So reptiles are ectothermic. They regulate their body temperature by moving to areas um, that are you know, warm throughout the day. So this is a great way to promote exercise for captive reptiles. It is simple and possible to have a um, multiple different heat lamps on top, at the top of a um, tank, and they can be on a timer so that the lights on one side of the tank come on first, and then the lights in the middle come on while those ones on the side turn off. And finally, the ones on the other side come on and the lights on the middle turn off. And that will simulate the pattern of the sun moving across the sky that a reptile would experience in the wild. It will help and it um, will elicit some locomotory behavior so that you know, your animal will be moving across the enclosure throughout the day following that lighting and heat pattern. Um, we can also... Uh, another way to do this is to put heat lamps on a track, and this can be very cost effective. So the track runs over the top and the lights um, move across on the track. And there will be, um, I'll show you a video of that um, being done in an aquarium, but it's the same concept of moving lights um, at the end of this talk as well. And then so yeah, we can have all these different types of branches. You want to think about different uh, having multiple width, widths of branches and shapes of branches, um, different logs, um, different heights and areas that are dark and areas that are light, um, different textures for the animals to grip and feel um, to make a more complex environment. So we can also do sensory enrichment, which as um, I mentioned before, olfactory enrichment is probably uh, very important for reptiles since they do have such a good sense of smell and many species use scent marking or um, dung piling to mark their territories in the wild. So I would like to see more zoos incorporating um, olfactory enrichment for their reptiles. And you can also have uh, different tactile um, enrichment, so different textures for them to feel. Um, could be brush board or various leaves. Um, think about, you know, what textures a snake's body might feel um, in the wild. Maybe different, you know, pebbles, um, different things to grip onto around the enclosure. Um, it's possible to provide auditory enrichment, which is sound, um, that you could have a recording of natural wildlife sounds um, or different types of music. Reptiles do hear. Um, I don't think, I haven't read much research on their hearing abilities. Um, 
and it's you know obviously they don't most of most reptiles don't vocalize very much at all so auditory enrichment might not be the most important thing but it is a possibility um, and then visual enrichment is going to be very important they are very visual they see well and they see color well uh, a couple of different studies have shown that tortoises can discriminate between different colors and I um, will show you a video at the end of this which shows a um, yellow-footed tortoise discriminating between different colors um, and determining which target is red. Um, so uh, we know that tortoises prefer different colored items to eat, like bright red berries are a favorite item. Um, so think about the colors of the berries that these animals are eating or the you know um, and what you can do with that you can also have backdrops uh, for enclosures and you could have a photograph of their natural environment blown up and stick that on the back of the terrarium you can um, try uh, some there are videos on YouTube of pet reptiles interacting with um, video like games on iPhones and they uh, can play games where they're catching bugs with their tongue on a phone or a tablet so we can do more of that um, and then uh, yeah just uh, try to you know obviously brainstorm and plan and then evaluate the safety of any new enrichment item um, but try to think really creatively because um, we tend to not do nearly enough enrichment for reptiles um, also think about you know if they spend time near water or in the water you can have different shapes and um, types of ponds you could have different dishes with different water um, so you can move that out you can have um, even like a waterfall or flowing stream just with a little pump. Um, think about that. And then finally, food. You can give them different types of food or hide the food in different parts of the um, tank so that they have to walk around to find their food. Um, seeking behavior is very pleasurable for animals. There's a concept in animal behavior science called contra freeloading, which means that animals prefer to work for their food rather than having it given to them just on a plate or in a bowl. Um, so one way to provide foraging enrichment is to place the food in various different locations so that um, they're searching for the food. Jack Panskep, who is a, or sorry, Jack, Panksep is a, an animal behavior scientist who um, has said that seeking, the urge to seek, um, is the basic impulse and it is to search, investigate, and make sense of the environment. So seeking is the basic in impulse to search, investigate, and make sense of one's environment. And this seeking emotion um, is very pleasurable. And if you have implanted electrodes into the brain of an animal and um, it has been found that a lot of animals will self-stimulate those regions of their brains because um, the region, the, the feeling of seeking and searching for food is so pleasurable. So um, most of that research been, has been done with mammals, but we can extrapolate and um, think about how to provide foraging and food seeking opportunities for reptiles who do hunt for food in the wild and do search out different types of vegetation. Um, so some way, uh, other ways that other than hiding the food around the enclosure, you can um, actually have puzzle feeders and uh, recent fairly recent study with anolis lizards found that um, they actually are able to solve problems and 
reach their food um, from a little puzzle feeder setup. So they um, had basically a brick with some with two holes in it and put a plastic lid over each hole, but the lids were each a different color. And the lizards could determine, they could learn which color um, indicated that the food was under that lid and then climb up onto the brick and uh, very carefully like pull the plastic lid off to get access to the food which was inside the hole and then reach down into the hole to get the food lifted out and eat it. Um, so the, there are um, ways that we can create a lot more complex opportun um, eating um, behaviors for captive reptiles. So I would love to see uh, more puzzle feeders being used and we you know, just have to be creative and design those. Um, but enrichment, it doesn't have to be too expensive. I have seen uh, lizards in zoos that have like cardboard tubes that are added to their enclosures or just a cardboard box or a little plastic tub um, and then rotated out so that there, you know, there are different things that they're finding. Um, and I will, you know, I think my main takeaway is that we tend to underestimate the um, cognitive abilities of reptiles and they tend to be um, not, we tend not to provide them with as much enrichment as we should, but we can absolutely um, creatively come up with ways to make their enclosures more complex. Of course, we need to make sure that they have the correct temperatures and humidity levels and, and monitor their health. Um, and you know we can do all like we can do all of that and we can also provide uh you know new items for them to climb on and puzzles for them to solve to get their food um and i have oh and so those are all you know i've that's a sort of an overview of how to create a create some enrichment uh, protocols for your captive lizards or reptiles in general. Um, next topic that I want to talk about, I'm switching from enrichment and ethology to training. So I do uh, work as an animal trainer and I want I can tell you that it is pattern and they can uh, learn through positive reinforcement training. So positive reinforcement training is rewarding the dis, um, behave is all reward based. And it's force free. So no punishment is used, you don't um, hurt the animals in any way. Um, and it is the type of training that is being done in modern zoos and it's being used to um, train reptiles to um, perform behaviors like touching a target or sticking out their tongues um, or moving to different locations in their enclosure um, as well as um, like going into um, containers to be moved to different enclosures all voluntarily on their own without having to be picked up. Um, you can easily train them to uh, walk onto a scale to be weighed or slither onto a scale to be weighed if it's a snake um, or onto a pole that's attached to a scale um, and then also to voluntarily participate in veterinary treatments. Studies have shown that um, large lizards are 
stressed when they are restrained for veterinary procedures. So their stress, they've, um, you know, that study involved uh, test, blood tests that found increased stress hormones in the blood. Um, when people were forcefully restraining these large lizards. So there is a reason to train captive reptiles to voluntarily participate in veterinary treatment and it is possible. I will show videos of positive reinforcement training of reptiles at the end of this talk. Um, and. I just want to talk you through the process of training reptiles and it is can be slightly different um, working with reptiles than with animals that eat more frequently so um, and it's a little bit different than working with mammals too because you can use different types of rewards so you shape behavior by rewarding successive approximations of the desired behavior um, until the animal is eventually performing the exact behavior that you want. And you can mark the desired movement um, as the animal moves into that position by clicking a clicker. Um, a, you can also use a flash of light or a sound, another sound to mark um, the desired behavior the moment it occurs. And then you give the reward or reinforcer just after marking the behavior. Um, so with um, one example of this is called targeting and uh, you can put a target stick or uh, you know a, a piece like a square or a circle connected to a stick and the uh, reptile can touch that with his nose so you could mark any movement uh, as the reptile moves closer to the target and then you could use a box clicker and make that click sound that could mark that the uh, movement toward the target is what you want and then you would give them a reward. Before doing that you should choose the correct reward. A uh, reward should be something that the animal is willing to work for and you can do a preference test. Um, so you can put a tray down with various different types of food and you know all different types of food that that particular species uh, eats, especially their preferred food items. Um, and then you can have the tortoise or lizard or turtle uh, walk up to the tray or and choose you put the tray right in front of them and then they whatever food item they pick to eat first is probably going to be a great reinforcer and something that they desire the most so you for example you could have different types of fruit and berries and um, your tortoise could you know, choose whichever piece of fruit um, that he or she likes the most and then you could use small pieces of that fruit as the reinforcer or reward for desired behaviors. With reptiles um, who don't eat very frequently, especially you know those who only are fed once a week, um, just be sure to remember that you're only going to be able to train them around those feeding times if you're using food rewards. So it may take longer to train a new behavior than it would with an animal who eats more frequently. And you'll have to be very precise about doing training at feeding time every week. Um, but it may be a slower process, but it is totally possible to train this way and to shape new behaviors um, over a longer time period. And you can also, um, if you're working with snakes, snakes can totally be trained too. It's really impressive to see uh, videos of trained snakes. They're doing some of that at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. And uh, they to have told me that they take a mouse and cut it up into really small pieces because they've found that smaller rewards work better when they're um, training the snakes. 
because of how long it takes snakes to eat and digest the um, a mouse, uh, apparently like smaller pieces worked better. You can uh, choose the size of the reinforcer. It can be as small as um, a piece as the animal is willing to work for. And then um, you can also, the great thing about training reptiles is that you can use a different type of reinforcer. It doesn't have to be food. It can be um, heat because they desire to be in warm basking spots. So you could um, instead, we could do the same scenario. So if you're target training a lizard, um, you could click as the lizard walks toward the target stick and then turn on a, a heat lamp. Um, or you could click and then move a little barrier to allow the lizard to walk into the basking area. Of course, we uh, we don't need to deprive these animals of food in order to train them. Um, I know tortoises have been trained using sort of preferred treats. Yellow-footed tortoises were given like toppings, their favorite little fruit pieces, but then given their regular diet as well um, during training sessions. And they were able to learn to target, um, as you'll see in the videos later on. And uh, crocodiles can and alligators can be trained. Um, you could, you know, either toss them a piece of meat or you could uh, have a heated area that they can get to. And you can use, um, you know, whatever reward the animal prefers. Some really uh, useful applications of training include getting shy tortoises uh, that are fearful of people, more used to uh, being in the presence of visitors so that you can use them in educational programs. Um, that's a great application of target training because it'll get them used to working with people and coming out from their hiding spots. Um, I have trained lizards who were really fearful of people and really stressed in captivity to um, get used to being held and then they learn to enjoy being held. Um, just keep uh, the animal's welfare in mind and keep things you know uh, fun for them and um, I yeah definitely stay away from anything that could hurt them. Uh, it's keep it all force free and use the positive reinforcement training. Um, so now I'm going to show you some videos of a anolis lizard um, finding food from a puzzle feeder, and then there will be videos of that yellow footed tortoise learning to touch the target and. Uh, learning to discriminate between different colors. So right before I show you those videos, I just want to say the takeaway from this should be that reptiles are much more intelligent than we give them credit for. Um, they have behavioral needs and um, they're often more active in the wild than they are in captivity. Um, so we need to work to enrich their environments and um, we can use positive reinforcement training to elicit natural behaviors as well. Um, make sure they're getting enough exercise and that they have mental stimulation and you know they some species are more social than we may think. Um, they do have good senses of smell and sight. Um, they can discriminate between different colors and they can solve puzzles and they do like working and hunting for their food. They also, you know, enjoy climbing and getting lots of exercise in enriched environments. Um, so keep all of that in mind and I look forward to seeing the creative enrichment uh, devices that you design to elicit the natural behaviors of all these amazing species of reptiles. Um, and, you know, uh, 
I'm really looking forward to more research, uh, testing different enrichments um, devices, seeing how they um, in change the behavior of different species, and um, it's a really rich area for research and uh, improvement. Thanks so much for having me, and here are the videos.